Get the latest Impact Podcast right into your inbox each week. Subscribe by entering your email address at impactpodcast.com to make sure you never miss an interview. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigeri, and I'm so honored to have with you today Paul Augustine. He's the head of sustainability for Lyft. That's right, Lyft, L-Y-F-T. Welcome, Paul, to the Impact Podcast. Thanks so much for having me, John. It's an honor to be here. Hey, Paul, you're doing some very important work, obviously, at Lyft, and we want to get into that in a little bit. But before we get into that, I'd love for you to share with our listeners and our viewers the Paul Augustine backstory, how you even got here and what your journey growing up leading to this point in your career really looked like. Sounds great. Um, I'm going to take you way back. I'll take you back a previous generation, actually. Okay. So my dad grew up as one of 13 kids in rural India on a farm. Um, And when he came to the U.S., he settled in Buffalo, New York and brought a little bit of that farming to Buffalo. Uh, We grew up with fruit trees and vegetable gardens. And uh, I spent a lot of time outdoors in the beautiful Buffalo summers, as well as the famous snowy winters. Um, I was outside. And so I, I just developed this love for nature and appreciation for all that we we get from nature. Mm. Um, so fast, fast forward uh, to college. Uh, when I entered college, I knew that I wanted to set myself up for a career in which I can help the world and improve people's lives. Huh. Um, and I thought that initially I thought that was going to be medicine. And then uh, two courses actually changed my career trajectory. So first was a intro to environmental engineering. Okay. And I kind of fell into this course by accident. But as I learned more about the environmental challenges that we were facing and the technology solutions that were already out there, I got really excited. And then I took another course in environmental policy and law and learned about the large scale impact that policy can make in our environmental issues. So I studied environmental engineering and economics and then uh, went on to grad school to, to focus more on climate and energy issues. Um, and then coming out of coming out of school, I went to the federal government and worked as a presidential management fellow for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Senate Energy Committee on climate policies and air pollution programs. Uh, I was there for about three years and then I saw that the investment community was actually putting money to work in solutions on the ground to reduce emissions and joined RNK Capital, which at the time was one of the largest investment firms focused on green commodities. So I I started there uh, as a trader and traded a large portfolio of carbon credits, renewable energy certificates, emission credits. Um, also invested in carbon offset projects. Um, so I was there through the recession, uh, which wasn't the best time to be working on Wall Street, to be honest. Um, uh, but there was one bright spot in the environmental markets, and that was California. California was starting its greenhouse gas cap and trade program 
And so a recruiter reached out to me from Southern California Edison, the large electric utility, um, and said they need, needed someone to help build out their carbon trading strategy, their carbon trading desk, and work on the policy side as the rules were being developed. And it was just the perfect opportunity for me. Uh, so I moved over to California, sunny California, uh, and uh, helped build out the the carbon strategy for Southern California Edison. Also got to work on renewable energy and electric vehicles to some extent. Uh, from there, I went to Chicago uh, and worked for a consulting company, consulting to utilities throughout the country on different topics, including community solar, utility of the future policy, and smart grid deployment. And uh, did that out of Chicago for two years and then moved to San Francisco for two years. Um, and as a consultant working out of San Francisco, I was traveling every week uh, down to Arizona. Oh. And I would, uh, I would come back every week and talk to my wife about the week. And the highlights for my week were usually the conversations with my Lyft driver. Uh, so I took a, between four and 10 lifts every single week for about a year and a half. And uh, it was really this deep connection to the Lyft drivers and learning about their stories and the different walks of life that they were coming from, um, you know, talking to veterans, talking to folks that needed flexibility to take care of the loved one, college students looking to earn money uh, to pay for school, and a lot of retirees whose spouses told them that they needed to get out of the house and, and talk to other people. Um, <laughs> And that that really made me, I, I had already been following Lyft as a company because of its values and uh, the connection with the drivers was really what brought me to Lyft as well as the opportunity to uh, make a large scale impact in terms of transportation emissions. Well, first of all, I want to I unpack a little bit of your past and I'm, we're going to go into Lyft. And so a couple of things, back in rural India, what were your, what were your, um, uh, grandparents and relatives farming back back there. Yeah, so they they had uh, this is fresh in my mind because I was just there at the farm that oh. my dad grew up on. Oh. Um, so they had a variety of crops. Uh, the cash crop there was rubber. Um, they also had coconut, uh, pepper, and a host of other things as well. Did some of your relatives, uh, brothers, sisters, or cousins take over the family business that are still in it? Yeah, so my uncle is still there, uh, running running the farm. Huh. And what did dad become when he came, when he moved you guys to Buffalo? What was dad's profession? Dad became a doctor. Okay, that's why you, that's why you were sort of headed towards medical. Yeah. School. And you there, were there. There was a little bit of pressure from him. Uh, we had we had a, a number of long conversations, and uh, my sis, my older sister, did help. She also went into medicine, so. I had to have a lot of long, long conversations with my dad about other profession, and that's sort of normal. I mean, if, 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 if right, and you're in, you know, that's that's oh, yes. a, that's normal. That's a normal um, thing, and you're very humble, obviously. But you got when you talked about your formal education, which got you on this wonderful trajectory. You, I just want for our listeners and viewers to understand, went undergrad to Yale, then masters at Columbia. Two That's of the right. greatest institutions in the United States. But what it set you up for, really, the, the the education is you've had a very versatile career and really got to touch so many areas in the sustainability uh, field that made you so qualified for this wonderful position that you now have. Yeah, I, I was really uh, fortunate to have a lot of really great professors and mentors over the past couple of decades, including while I was at school that helped shape the trajectory of my professional life. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. And um, so what a wonderful connection to connect with the drivers and that lead to this, you know, that's such a, a great storyline, but it's so true though, because really we connect with brands in different ways and to have such a great experience on a week by week basis, not just one unique anomaly of a driver, so many wonderful experiences leading you to really fall in love with the brand and making you want to be a part of that brand. That's a real great storyline. I like that a lot. I know to hear that a lot, actually. I don't hear that a lot. 
So talk about now, what year did you get this wonderful position of head of sustainability at Lyft? And were you the first head of sustainability there? So I was not the first uh, head of sustainability. So uh, my predecessor, Sam, joined Lyft in March 2018. And then I joined Lyft uh, about six months later to build out, um, build out the sustainability program. And I have stuck around uh, long enough to take take the reins over and um, build this into a, a broader and more comprehensive sustainability program. I'm always interested when you walk into what it was relatively speaking compared to GM or compared to Pepsi or Gillette. Lyft is a relatively new brand. It's part of our new generation of brands. So creating a sustainability program, laying the groundwork for uh, sustainability from your perspective and all the great things that have informed you, which your experience was vast, how do you go about doing it? What do you use as benchmarks and um, to, to really create a program that matches the company's values and 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 DNA, but also takes what you and were informed by historically, and you get to lay that into that and leave your stamp on it as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think there were a couple pieces of context with regard to the company that helped refine what our strategy was. Mm -hmm. um, so first, uh, I just want to mention that Lyft is a founder-led company. Uh, so our our co-founders are still here leading Wonderful. the company forward, and they care deeply about sustainability, both of them. Um, right. So Logan, our, our CEO, comes from an environmental and transportation planning background, and John, our president, comes from a hospitality background and was deeply inspired by a Green Cities course that he took. And so when they founded Lyft, sustainability was part of their, their reason for founding Lyft. They believed that reducing single occupancy vehicles on the road was an integral part of um, of creating the sustainable transportation future and transforming cities to be built around people and not cars. And it's actually embodied in Lyft's mission, which is to improve people's lives with the world's best transportation. And so it's been embedded uh, within who the company is. It's, it's just part of our fabric. And right, well Axiomatically speaking, as you just said, that's a great point, Paul. Being part of the shared economy itself is a sustainable business model. That's right. That's right. right. That makes sense. That makes total so, sense. So, I, you know, I, I have this great platform where the company was founded in part based on this ideal of developing more sustainable transportation futures, uh, or a more sustainable transportation future. And basically, I came in. Um, to help develop something more uh, tangible and concrete in terms of the strategy for sustainability. Understood. Understood. And how much how much latitude are you given? Is it pretty much a, a piece of blank canvas and you and Sam just start to paint and, and make it come to life and build it from the you know ground up? So the, the thing that I love about Lyft also is that we uh, we do have to prioritize ruthlessly. And so when we think about the impact that we can have, yeah. we are focused on transportation. Right. Um, so there's a, there are a lot of other pieces to how we, um, how we approach sustainability, including external reporting, some of the traditional corporate sustainability work. We have a hardware footprint because of our uh, micro-mobility program, so developing... Uh, sustainable end of life, as well as product design approaches. But the biggest impact in terms of carbon and other emissions is from vehicles driving on our platform for ride share. And so we've been very focused on getting to a fully electrified platform. And that's, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when I read through your materials and other information about all the great work you're doing at Lyft, your goal, if I'm not mistaken, is to have everything fully electrical by by 2030. That's correct. Wow! So it's it's already 2023. As you and I know, years go by kind of fast. You know, you've already been. They do. You know, <laughs> they're, they're, it really does. I mean, and 
So seven years sounds long in one respect, but actually isn't that long. So how are you working towards that very bold and virtuous goal? Uh, so there, there are a number of ways that we're approaching this. So first, we, we know we can't do this alone. We know there is a broader systemic change that needs to happen. So one area that we've been focused on has been on policy. So advocating for the policies that are going to help the entire economy um, switch to electric vehicles. And we've seen a lot of progress at the federal and state level just in the last couple of years. So we're really excited about that. Um, another area that we've been focused on has been a uh, rental program. So currently most EV models are you know, 40 plus thousand dollars, which puts them out of reach for many, uh, many Americans generally and right. many Lyft drivers. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that we have um, focused on in terms of e an easier access point for drivers has been a flexible weekly rental program that we have called Express Drive and onboarding EVs into that program. And then another area that we've been, we've been focused on, and I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that we were able to uh, launch some new, um, some new EV offerings in December of last year uh, to help get our drivers into EVs, including an incentive for drivers in, in certain markets to uh, drive EVs, um, a charging discount for uh, public fast charging, and then a uh, discount for home charging infrastructure. Wow. So let's, let's unpack that a little bit. So these are bold goals and these are great landmarks that you've created to make this goal a reality. When you go to bed at night and you lay in bed and you're thinking about this, the path ahead, what keeps you up? What's the biggest sticking point in these issues to actually making this a reality by 2030? So there, there are a lot of uh, challenges that we need to overcome. Um, seven years is a very short timeline, and it does keep me keep me up at, at night sometimes. Right. Um, we we're essentially trying to overcome some of the biggest challenges in transportation. Uh, this includes a hundred years plus of marketing that equates car ownership to freedom, um, right. and also a hundred plus years of folks getting comfortable with using gasoline to power power their vehicle. Um, it's going to take take a lot of effort in order to uh, to change uh, personal behaviors and comfort with this new technology. Uh, the thing that excites me, though, is we're working on the ground to solve for wide-scale adoption of EVs. In order to be successful in meeting our goal, uh, we need to bring EVs to everybody. This is this is an equity challenge that we're facing. When right. I look at the demographics of our drivers, over 70% of them um, identify as minorities, and nearly half of our trips start or end in low-income communities. So these are the people and the places that have been left out of the EV transition and the broader clean tech transition. So I'm excited about the fact that we have to work on democratization of this technology. We need to find ways to provide access to these expens expensive vehicles. So that this is this includes the rental program that I mentioned, and right. we need to uh, provide access to EV charging in areas that haven't received uh, received charging to date. It's interesting. And going back to what you just said, um, it, you know, given that we're both, I'm Armenian, we both come from Im immigrant roots. Um, not only did, was owning a car equate to freedom, it also was one of the trademarks of success of actually making it here. Whenever the American dream used to be, that was one of those check marks that, okay, home, car, Etc. Color TV, whatever, whenever that list was or used to be, it was. But that you bring up a great point um, about equity. Um, is America as a as a whole, both federally and on a state by state basis, moving fast enough 
on a policy basis to help you as a private enterprise achieve your goals? It's it's never fast enough. Okay. Uh, I think I think the progress that we've started to make, especially at the federal level with the Inflation Reduction Act uh, moving forward last year and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act moving forward is going to be huge in terms of um, supporting EV adoption and access to EV charging. Uh, there's a lot more that needs to be done. And what we're trying to do is lift, you know, we have a lot of data, is, is we're trying to support uh, smart decision making from the the government in terms of where is their demand, where are, where are drivers going to be, where do they um, live in a in a way that protects the driver data, but also helps inform decisions in terms of where billions of dollars of public money is going to be invested. Um, so we're trying to partner with governments in order to help accelerate this transition to a electrified future and make sure that um, public Money is getting the most bang for the buck. That's a fascinating issue. You, since you have such a great reputation of having worked on both sides of the aisle, actually all three sides of the aisle, what I would call three sides, finance, as a public servant for the government, and now for a company, a for-profit company, are you then called upon by government officials to inform them like DOE and DOD, um, I mean DOE and DOT, to give them feedback on their dispute before they come out with their final uh, decisions on how things could be better if they uh, approach their legislation or alter their legislation that they're contemplating. Are you one of those key people that they that they talk to on a regular basis? Uh, there, there's a lot of public stakeholder engagement going on right now as these uh, as the implementation rules are being. Uh, being set. And so we are trying to engage um, directly to help inform and provide insight because, you know, we have been working on this, on this electrification journey for years now. So we have a lot of on the ground experience uh, and lessons learned, which we do try to share with policymakers. As a competitive advantage, sustainability can, can be a powerful tool. Um, Paul, is it a competitive advantage over your competitors to announce this kind of bold vision and begin executing on it as compared to any of your other competitors who might not be that forward thinking? Uh, so I, I'll say that when we made this commitment to 100% EVs back in, in 2020, mm. um, we, we made this commitment because we wanted to drive our competitors forward. We also wanted to be a catalyst for change for other, um, other private sector entities. So including um, industries that, are, aren't, uh, that we aren't participating in, auto manufacturers, rental car companies, and others. Um, we wanted to create this path for others to follow. So well, what, I, what I'm really excited about is that our largest competitor followed our lead um, a couple months later and made a similar commitment. And right. now it's basically a race to the top, not a race to the bottom. And so uh, we're, we're excited. We're not, we're not um, scared or disappointed that this is, this is not a competitive advantage for us uh, it, within our industry. We're, we're excited about racing to the top and doing what's best for our drivers, for the communities that we serve and for the planet. I love that because Paul, you're you're you know, and for those listeners and viewers who've just joined us, we've got Paul Augustine with us today. He's the head of sustainability for Lyft, to find Lyft, and to find Paul and his great colleagues and the important work they're doing with electric electri electrifying whatever, making their whole fleet electric by 2030. You can find them at www.liftlyft.com. You're a new breed of leader, though, Paul. You know, they're, the leaders in business used to be Game of Thrones. It used to be zero-sum game. But you're that new breed of leader that leads by being inspirational and, and aspirational in hopes that others, both direct competitors and others in adjacent or non-adjacent industries, follow because you realize, and you and obviously uh, you're brilliant enough to realize that 
It's not a zero-sum game. We all live on one planet. Nobody wakes up hoping that they drink uh, you know, worse water or, or breathe worse air than they did the day before. Everyone wants their children and grandchildren to have a better planet than they had. And, uh, and that's wonderful that your inspirational leadership paid off by having both a direct competitor and others start making similar commitments. And that's really, that's part of a new generational type of business leader. And I really applaud you for that. And that's, that's a wonderful way to be because so many people, other people see business still as zero sum, Game of Thrones. If they're doing better, that means we're doing worse. And that's not the reality when it comes to sustainability or circular economy um, or really making the world a better place. Yeah, John, John, I think that is one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from my career um, between working in government, nonprofits, and different private sector um, industries is that we can't look at each other from a competitive standpoint or from a cynical view of each sector. We need to, we really do need to work together uh, in order to solve these issues. Um, transportation is the the biggest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. If we're serious about addressing climate change, we have to decarbonize transportation, and we have to do it quickly. I, I frankly, you know, having been in the space for a while, and you, you as well, and concerned. I'm deeply concerned about where we're headed in terms of the climate. Um, I studied climate science. Right. Almost 20, 20 years ago. And some of those climate models are coming into fruition where right. we're seeing tens of billions of dollars of damage, extreme weather events. Um, if we don't move with a sense of urgency and work in partnership and collaboration, we're just not going to meet the the goals of stabilizing the climate. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, just to an order of magnitude for our listeners and viewers and my sake, how many cars does Lyft have on the road? I want to understand how big and monumental uh, getting everybody into EVs by 2030 really is. And so we've got uh, we got over a million vehicles wow. active on our platform. We're also not just a rideshare company. We operate the largest micro micro mobility platform in the country. So we operate bike share in major cities as well as scooter share. And so the, the transition that we're trying to catalyze here is not just uh, shifting people into rideshare. What we're trying to catalyze is getting people out of personal car ownership into uh, other modes, other low carbon modes of transportation, which includes shared bikes, shared scooters, transit, as well as clean rideshare. That's wonderful. That's tremendous. Um, what, what, what does the future of transportation look like, um, Paul? You know, not only uh, with, like you said, not only with regards to just scooters and bikes and cars. Give us a little glimpse on what you what you foresee things are going to look like by twenty thirty and beyond. Yeah, it, you know, it's interesting to see, just talk to young people these days. And I think the mindset, getting back to our earlier discussion around car ownership, um, the mindset has changed. Yep. Uh, younger people, some of them, uh, don't feel a need to get a driver's license. Um, owning a car is sometimes seen as more of a burden than a benefit. And I think we're going to continue to see these trends and where it leads is is basically a transportation future that is, that is shared, electric, and multimodal. Um, and I believe Lyft is leading the way in this transformation by offering a convenient alternative to car ownership, by investing and in expansion of electric vehicles, by operating and expanding uh, shared bikes and scooters, and linking everything together in a in one app. In one app. Wow. That's exciting. That's exciting. Are, are apps a big part of the future of Lyft in terms of technology, inter, interrelating technology, both uh, the technology in our hand with transportation? Is that going to continue to con be a connective tissue 
between the future of transportation and getting us more motivated to get out of ownership and into um, the shared economy? Yeah, I, I mean, this is another challenge that we face right now. If you own a car, it is yeah. very easy for you to just get the keys, hop in your car, and drive, right? and uh, fuel it if you need to fuel it. So we need to compete with that. So we need to have something that is uh, equally reliable and convenient to that. And I think that is basically what we are developing here and expanding at Lyft. With regards to sustainability, the macro uh, vision of sustainability, uh, Silicon Valley is a hotbed of wonderful and super smart folks like you, Paul. Do you get together with other sus sustainability leaders in Silicon Valley and share best practices as a whole outside of just the EV um, uh, ecosystem and just share uh, best practices on sustainability and inspire each other with regards to shared best practices? I think you know, you're part of the sustainability community. I think that's one of the great things about uh, sustainability professionals. Yep. We do try to share knowledge, lessons learned. Um, it is a highly collaborative environment. So there are, there are a number of forums um, and uh, groups that are pulled together by nonprofits, for example, that pull together tech companies and others as well, where we have the opportunity to share lessons learned and there are areas where we may not have the expertise because it's not our focus area. And there are other areas like transportation where, where we are the experts. And the great thing about um, sustainability professionals is that we do try to share uh, share what we know in, in order to help meet this global challenge that we're facing. And every year, do you guys put out a, an impact and ESG report? We do. So that was... Uh, that was something that we developed back in 2020 was our first report. We've been releasing our annual environmental social governance report uh, since then. And what, what month do you typically put it out? Uh, then the, the last year we released it, I believe in August. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll probably release it again in August this year. In August, got it. What's besides getting everybody electric by in your, on your platform by 2030. What else can you tease or share or excite our listeners and viewers about what's next for Lip Paul? Yeah, so a couple other areas that we are focused on. One is um, providing data to with business customers. So Lyft uh, has a number of business partners where they sign up for a Lyft business account and let their employees use oh. our services to get around um one key uh one key aspect of making better decisions on um on sustainable practices is better quality data so the lift rides are part of scope three emissions so providing uh, an easy way for our lift business partners to access that data will hopefully allow them to make better decisions in terms of um in terms of their scope three emissions and they will also be able to track um, how we're doing in terms of decarbonizing our platform. So it's also part of our um, efforts to keep ourselves accountable and make the data transparent. That's really important. You know, I find that one of the main tenets now of good, responsible sustainability practices is radical transparency. So you're saying that if I was the director of sustainability or chief sustainability officer at Goldman Sachs and Lyft was our chosen vehicle company to transport our employees, you create a dashboard for us so I can have a dashboard, a daily dashboard to see how, what kind of usage we're doing with Lyft and time of day, length, uh, carbon emissions and everything, all the algorithm points that we were interested in and tracking at Goldman Sachs or whatever company it would be. That's right. That, that's kind of where, where we're headed uh, in terms of providing that type of transparency. And I think that that speaks to the the broader um, conversation and sustainability reporting. That's where right. We need more consistency and transparency, especially with regard to scope three emissions. And also then I have to report to my analysts and my C-suite and my board of directors. So you giving me that that dashboard 
makes it much easier. I don't have to go chase that information down and it's not fragmented anymore at my company. So you Definitely. literally create a, a, a portal for that and make it really easy to track and then also report on. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I love it. I, I love it. Well, that's great, Paul. I mean, uh, uh, are, you, are you finding that this position, you get to draw upon all your past experiences, like you said, uh, and everything you've done in policy, at, 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 at a, as a financier, as a public servant, as a nonprofit, and now as a, a you know, as a, at a for-profit business that's really mission-based in many ways, besides profit-based, and also part of the greater mission is making the world a better place. Do you get to draw on all of your experience on a daily basis? Uh, 100%. Every iota of my experience and background somehow comes comes to use in in my day to day. That's so wonderful. Well, I think they've picked the right guy because you definitely have all the all the right background to make this a reality. And we're so grateful for your time today. And we're so grateful that you and your colleagues at Lyft are committed to going electric by 2030. I think that is a bold and very virtuous uh, um, uh, challenge, but also goal. And I know you're going to get there with someone like you leading the charge at, at Lyft. You're going to get there. Paul, thank you. You're always welcome back on the Impact Podcast to share the continued journey in EV and sustainability at Lyft with our listeners and our viewers. And thank you for not only making the impacts that you and Lyft make, but thank you also for making the world a better place. John, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com.